within Palestinian history, mostly Palestinians were resisting through non-violent ways or non-armed ways, let's say, as we call it. Most of the people were non-armed and there was no Palestinian army per se. And uh, the first Palestinian resistance armed struggle movement officially started in 1965. So we waited between 1948 to 1965 so that the international community starts something. <laughs> so my first memory with the war officially was in 1967. Uh, I was born in Aida refugee camp, which is one of 59 refugee camps which were established after this tragedy. My parents were among the 70% of refugees who were forced out of their villages, which were destroyed in 1948, like 534 villages at that time. Uh, so Aida is one of the three refugee camps in Bethlehem area where lives today about 6,200 people and that most of the people have resisted through non-armed ways or what you refer to as non-violent way. Well, though I, I don't like the terminology of non-violence when it's compared to resistance, a legitimate resistance as they qualified as uh, violence. Yeah. Because violence is a wanton aggression against innocent people Mm -hmm. and not self-defense in, mm -hmm. in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. And people who are, who are under occupation and under oppression have every legitimate right to resist by all means. So I don't know if we can qualify their legitimate resistance as violence, even if it is armed or, or, or non-armed. So that's a bit of a difference I have with Gandhi. <laughs> But the essence of it is that most people choose non-armed ways to struggle, to trying to keep their identity, their humanity, their beauty, their culture, and so on. I was not a fan of, uh, of guns or whatever. I never carried a gun in my life. Uh, like almost 99% of Palestinian people who have never carried a gun in their life. As a scientist, uh, I didn't discover genes of hatred, eye violence, uh, and violence in, in that sense. But I understand that people have different reactions and responses to injustice and oppression between somebody who write a, a, a play or make a film or make a painting or a poem or remain silent or hide or submit or go and explode, explode himself or herself or carry a gun to defend what he believes, believes just and right. So these are the possibilities. I don't think that people tend to wear non, uh, to wear uh, weapons because they love it just to kill everybody. I mean, it, it, these are things that are taught and not uh, people are born with. So that's why it's giving these possibilities of non-armed ways or non-violent ways for beautiful, creative, positive uh, self-expression that give that these possibilities. That as human beings, we share a lot of things that should bring us closer to each other. And that we have differences that should enrich us and not make us afraid of from each other. Mm -hmm. That when we talk about justice, freedom, peace, equality, love, these are values that we share as human beings, whether we are Muslim or Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or Hindu or atheist or whatever we are, we have no compromises to make on these values. Until 1998, where with a group of friends, I founded Arwad. Arwad means the pioneers in Arabic. And we started with this philosophy that I call beautiful resistance. Because on one side, I believe every act of resistance against injustice, oppression, occupation, dictatorship is a beautiful act of a humanity because you reject any kind of injustice. And resisting through culture, arts, education are great acts of resistance because the aim essentially was how to save lives, how to inspire hope, how to give our children and young people possibilities to express themselves in the most beautiful, creative and non-armed ways. And hopefully they will think living for their country rather than die for their country. Uh, it's never easy. And uh, we don't have a magical wand to make the change. So you need a, a com huge commitment, passion, uh, and patience. And uh, in order to also inspire the young people and so on. 
a lot of people when they come to Palestine say, you know, it's very complicated, it's hopeless. I say we don't have this luxury of despair. This is not a heritage that we can leave to our children and your children and the generations to come. We are committed to bring hope. We are committed with a steadfast hope that every day that comes should be more beautiful than the day that goes. And instead of just sitting down and complaining that everything is bad and it's always the fault of someone else, we identify with over oppressed in the world. And we don't consider ourselves as the only victims in this world because there is a lot of victims in this world. So that's why we cannot monopolize the suffering like some others and say we are the only people who, who suffer and no other suffering count. Every suffering count. If it is one individual or 20 million who suffer, every suffering counts and every injustice should be accounted for. Every oppressor should be accountable for his oppression. Thank you.